episode two of Creative Conversations. I am Rian Berry, and uh, this episode came around as a bit of a surprise. My sister Tracy Hopkins, or aka Tracy Berry Art, and I uh, developed a Pathfinder Artist series. Uh, it's a discussion series on Zoom where you can purchase a ticket for $15 and join us for uh, in-depth discussions on specific topics that help artists find their own path. It's a peer support um, endeavor, so she'll take uh, one month and be the host, and I'll take the next month and be the other host, and we do invite members of the group to come forward with their own topics, and then they can lead a session. So it's really all about knowledge sharing. And as this particular session started last Saturday, um, it is uh, it was called the remarkable growth of art interventions during COVID nineteen. And uh, as it started, and we were introducing ourselves, and the discussion um, began, I quickly realized the content was podcast worthy. Uh, so I hit that record button, and you get to be a fly on the wall of our conversation. And it's quite interesting. So what I'm going to do is just um, give you a little bit about what this session was about. So uh, the social restrictions imposed worldwide initially and over the past year were meant to protect individuals from adverse physical health outcomes. However, the government itself imposed containment approaches aimed at slowing the virus's spread have steadily and rapidly changed life as we know it. They wiped out social normacy, and as a result, loneliness has affected a significant portion of the global population's mental well-being, the outcomes of which we might not see entirely for years to come. Art intervention has alleviated and even prevented adverse mental health outcomes for many by reducing fear, anxiety, and isolation. From the uplifting street murals, online, digital art posters, and podcasts, to memes and live stream painting tutorials, weekly group creating sessions, artists have been supporting the world through the pandemic, often for free. So now, um, I wanted to let you know a little bit about Tracy Berry. So she is a visual artist uh, living in Northern Ontario. And we did have one guest that joined us. And he is also um, a creative living in Northern Ontario who does voice acting. So I hope you enjoy listening in to our conversation. I just want to let you know that I haven't um, been able to follow along with, like we haven't uh, practiced this either. So this is, I'm really looking forward to how much Rhiannon has put together for this. I I'm I know that we're, me and Rhiannon are doing this together, but Brian, I didn't want you to feel left out. This is going to be all new for me as well. Um, so if I make excitable faces on the camera i'm not faking it i get really excited and i'm looking forward to it. you so. can have her join your your group she's very expressive <laughs> yeah we're yeah. always looking for new versions, so yeah yeah that's so much fun like as soon as you said that i was like oh i remember listening to that stuff okay so um art and wellness that's what we're here to talk about today um so as I mentioned, I am a student and every time I take a course or do a project, I look through um, a therapeutic arts lens at any topic that they give me. So in doing that, I have read approximately 22 studies on art, intervention, wellness, and during the time of COVID. So it's been really interesting because there are already tons of studies out there, lots of information, and uh, it's exciting because in the next little while and as um, we return to whatever normal is going to be, um, this is going to like the residuals of this experience is going to last for a long time and a lot of really great information about this young sort of uh, field of therapeutic art-based recreation pro- programming is going to 
be built up, I feel, almost to the point of I can see it becoming like a, like a social prescription <clears throat> in the future. That's my humble opinion. <laughs> Uh, sometimes like in the UK, for instance, the nature therapy has become a social prescription. And I feel like art-based therapies is on its way to becoming similar. So these, um, there were four categories that really came out in the information that I read. And, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read each of the four out loud. And I want you to take your pen or maybe type on your computer, whatever you have handy just any thoughts that come to mind when I read them about what you participate in, what you run or organize, or just any thoughts that come to mind as I'm going through these points. And then I'm going to ask you your thoughts afterwards. Okay. So the first one is creative arts therapy. So this is usually facilitated by a registered therapist. It's usually one-to-one -one sessions focusing on the client's strengths. The therapist gains emotional insights from their client's expressions when words are not enough um, to build the rapport and get the relationship started. Um, opportunities uh, for the client to build confidence, to mitigate stress, uh, to build protective factors while also gaining emotional understandings about their own creative expressions. And it includes a treatment plan and a change goal. Uh, I think that that is really what separates it from the other categories is one, it's, you know, a registered therapist, but two is that there is a treatment plan and a change goal. And then lastly, it's used to identify trauma, monitor stress levels, and sometimes also um, measure developmental levels. So that's category one. Category two is mindfulness art-based programs. They're smaller in size, uh, usually groups of up to 12 people facilitated by a wellness professional. So whatever that means to you, it was very vague in the studies, but a wellness coach, a wellness professional. They utilize visual art and crafting coupled with meditation and relaxation. So yoga, breathing, music. Uh, it focuses on the present and being immersed in the current activity and exploring complex emotions. So beyond happy and sad and more into loneliness, grief, jealousy, those sorts of realms, um, opportunity to cultivate a daily calm, self-acceptance, and there are brief moments of socializing with other members. Category number three, social arts groups. So those are usually organized by a social worker or a community service worker. Sometimes they hire um, an arts or culture worker to run in like one activity, one offs. Um, they're often led by peer instructors as well. So members of the group. The emphasis is on opportunities to socialize with group members and to form intimate connections. They feature easy and brief technical skills and lots of time to explore art techniques and supplies and more or less these ones the focus is on socialization so group discussions number four is artist studio immersion so that is usually facilitated by an artist so it could be a dancer it could be an actor it could be an artist a painter a sculptor whatever but um, those are educational and observation based and um, over during COVID, um, they took place over live streams, Zoom meetings, and they allow for brief conversations and social interactions with the other activity participants. Um, they usually feature crafting or painting tutorials overwhelmingly. And it's an opportunity to feel accepted and to build the participants' confidence. And sometimes there's a question and answer period but overall, this is an educational opportunity. So I'm going to um, ask both of you, uh, what did you think about those four overwhelming categories that are being studied right now? And where do you fit in? Do you want to go first, Brian? Sure. Um, I can't say specifically that uh, 
uh, I would fit in to any of those, but I can certainly see opportunities uh, where David could do some, maybe some streaming of uh, simple art techniques, some painting techniques that he uses to do that. Uh, through myself and the, the radio shows that we're doing, uh, it's given me some ideas to maybe, uh, I know you can do, um, I can't remember what it's called, but you just, uh, you've got it all recorded. You play, it's like a watch uh, party. That's it, that's it. Yeah. They call them watch parties. <laughs> you do a watch party and then maybe a little discussion discussion and, and something like that just to sort of take the um i can mean we're on spotify and youtube and stuff like that it's isolated in itself this would give people a chance to participate and comment on it and what they liked and didn't like and how it impacted them or the, you know just in general the, the stories it's a social gathering storytelling has always been a social thing so it, it might help along that line so i guess i would fall into the uh, final the fourth category you described there it's, it's close so yeah and i think also mindfulness as well you're like you're mentioning storytelling and sometimes you can get lost in a story right so mindfulness is like forgetting all your to-do lists and everything and just being like really present in in what you're doing and i know I'll listening to theater of the mind i was like right in there right so a little I bit of mindfulness too, I think. That yeah, yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I like the idea of um, being able to tune in and and join into a community where I am there to watch, like a fly on the wall, and be able to see all these different characters in different boxes, acting and. Um, in, 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 you know, doing a whole play in theater, but all the stages are set already because everybody in there, like this would be my set, I'm the artist and then I, I'm speaking to my agent, Brian, and I'm on the phone with him and, and, and you're doing that, like kind of that Brady Bunch boxes and having this, a group of people be able to watch a live theater show spoken through Zoom, say. And that would be something that in mindfulness, I could step away from my whole world and step into somebody else's world. I love that idea. Yeah, so do you guys just record voice or do you do video too? Uh, we've done 95% just uh, audio but we're, we're, we can see each other and it's almost like acting with each other. So by the time you hear it, it's like the old theater of the mind radio shows. Uh, but one of our creators is currently animating some of the kids ones. Wow. Um, so yeah, yeah, she's having, we're learning a lot of new things and uh, there's a lot of technology we've been experimenting with and finding out mm -hmm. the best way to, to mix audio. And uh, if uh, I noticed my, my internet warning light, uh, the weak signal has come up a few times dealing with the technological issues, they're inevitable. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, hey, James, your mic is muted again. Oh, sorry, you know, that kind of stuff. So, and uh, <laughs> we have a, one guy has a, has a pet cat and, uh, uh, it just rails out outside his door the whole time. And so we have to pause and shut up, cat. Like, <laughs> we actually wound up using the cat in one of our, we needed a, uh, a, a cat noise for one of the uh, murder mysteries. The, the cat knew what was going on. So you work stuff in, right? So. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I could see that. And then when it comes to um, David Winters, I was thinking, you know, yeah, he's, he, I mean, he's like more on the, the visual artist side, but he also works with a lot of musicians as well. And he knows many musicians. So being able to showcase what he does while potentially pairing up with a musician that he knows and having, he's such a great conversationalist. So being able to, for right now, during these times, maybe blend two creative arts together, I could see him being very good in that doing that oh well, yeah perhaps some some music uh that was composed like he does a lot of the the scenics from the area a lot of the sleeping giant a lot of the uh all the stuff from from that area up in northern uh ontario there and i just blending that with some new creative uh some new music or something that done by some local artists and mm -hmm. and uh you'd, you'd turn that into a meditation if you wanted to uh yeah. sort of like 
to sit back, relax, enjoy these gentle sounds and, yeah. and watch the visuals. That would be yeah. something. I turned one of my paintings into a meditation. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah. So um, some I was doing an exchange with artists, a call and response. And he sent me something with religion in it. And I was just kind of like, what am I going to do with this? So I was just like, okay, well, I'm going to do my version of heaven. So it was just floating pieces of land in the sky. And I painted it with acrylic on canvas, but then I, then I created like a whirlwind of the sky and floating back and forth. And I put it to like, ding, ding. Oh. and it, it went like everybody loved it. Do you remember that one, Tracy? No, oh, it I was like a short little 30, 30 minute video, but I can extend it to like five minutes. Yeah. And I was thinking about doing that and putting it on like YouTube as in its own channel, oh, like with a bunch now. of my paintings. Is it, is it up now, the video? Um, I have it on my Facebook page, my group, but it's probably pretty far down. I can write a little note to send it to you. I, I appreciate I that. It again. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. That's um, uh, one thing that's uh, challenging for a lot of people too, but uh, you, you, you were talking about the mindfulness one and uh, just going through this and struggling with the isolation and uh, everything being scaled back and isolated and um, just uh, mindfulness meditation of uh, being present in the moment. And w when you step outside and you hear the birds, you know, just acknowledging that they're there kind of thing. Yeah. So, well, and I, I can see that sort of, uh, I'd never really considered art as a therapy uh well you will the, after today yeah, well, <laughs> but i guess but in retrospect uh just based on what we've discussed so briefly here i i can see that you know joining in those little sketch parties and and everything i've been doing with uh with the radio shows and and such yeah. like that it, it, it's an extension it's a connection it's uh, it's it, it is therapy uh, like yeah. this it's it's what kept me same uh, yeah. <laughs> over, through, through all this so yeah it's good so I totally, um, I totally get that yeah it's a perfect. wonderful yeah yeah it, it is it's very you know when I paint myself I'm being mindful because I'm lost in the painting mm -hmm. yeah Tracy did you well that's that's where I think I come into the it's so fascinating to be able to look at some different categories and understand that if we are presenting, cause I do workshops as well. If we're presenting our workshops in such a way, we have to be knowledgeable and understanding as to what categories we are marketing towards. Here I am talking about business and how that can really affect and influence the people who could potentially um, be in the wrong workshop or group yeah, and how it could true. maybe affect them. Because I'm not a therapist, and but I do feel that I am a talkative person, and I place my insight onto, you know, um, wait, how do I say that? When I paint with others, I also do painting readings, so I'm able to express how what I see um, in their painting, and I usually say that that's kind of a message, like these are you, you might need to hear what's happening in your painting, depending on. You know, is there a broken tree in your painting or is the sky, what why did you choose that color? And we have these conversations, but I mean, I think it's the way that I advertise or the way that I invite people in that matters because anyone can join my groups and I am cautious about what I say, or I don't want to trigger anybody or give them the wrong advice. So I think it's really important to know for me where I land and I think I, I have worked with definitely social social art groups and they've hired me on. So they are the professionals hiring the entertainment. And then I'm also with you know the artist studio um, immersion. And that's really where I think I land. But for me looking at it from a business perspective, I better damn well make sure that I'm advertising it as that and not therapy. Yeah, and I think so there's a- I've, I've, yeah. I've mentioned to artists before is like, um, well, you're not a therapist. 
So you can't say this is art therapy. Yeah, so you can get around it by describing what you're doing. And still being honest about what you think it it gives people or how it heals people. Because I do believe that by what I'm doing and how I'm inviting people in and the people I've worked with, I do believe I'm adding to their lives. Um, but I'm not naive to the fact that I can only take it so far, right? This is where you know, there's life coaches, there's um, uh, music therapists, there's, uh, you know, many other routes that I would probably suggest to my students if it got to a certain point where I think they needed maybe more, um, edu ed like a more educated person in that field. Yeah, like a referral. Yes. So even for me, it's like, maybe I should find out who they are in my area and have them. So I can say, I can refer you to somebody and start working with someone and yeah. cross promoting even. For sure. For sure. And we're totally going to get into that conversation. Yeah. Sorry. I got excited, but that's no, right. You're I'm on the right track. For. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, I, I think it, if you present it a certain way that, that you're fine and you don't try to oversell it as, oh, this is the panacea, this is therapy. But if you come from a point of, of personal experience and say, you know, this has really helped me through the, uh, through the pandemic and through the lockdowns and so on and so forth. And um, the, uh, sorry, there's a conversation going on behind me now, but uh, you, you don't need to, uh, to take it to, Sorry, I just totally lost the thought there. Back to you, Rihanna. <laughs> okay. No, you're right. It, it, it's all, we're going to talk more about that too, but it's all about how you present it. And I've run into people where I said, you know, you can't, you can't say it's art therapy, but you can say it's a therapeutic art-based activity that encourages mindfulness, right? So it's all in how you say it. And uh, <clears throat> it's just like therapists are just held to a different standard of ethics and and whatnot, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you and there's there's legal ramifications yeah. around calling it therapy <clears throat> when exactly. You know, yeah, so. mm -hmm. I mean, okay. you, I I totally get what you're saying. Uh, I I I think that when we do uh, the radio program, I keep coming back to that because that's what I do. But yeah. Uh, but when I'm doing it and giving people a chance to unplug and sort of listen to something else, I'm not going to say, "Hey, listen to this. It's therapeutic or it's therapy." But it can be therapeutic to to unplug, disconnect from the real world for a little bit, and yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, and we're and totally now you can get those wheels spinning about how to market it, right? Like how to maybe market it a little bit differently. Well, it's also inspiring because I think us as creative people, and like Brian, with with what you do as well, that's that's a super creative lifestyle and route and job, and so like it does apply to this because now we're kind of starting to see, I'm starting to see more or less like, oh, okay, I do have value in the community. What I'm doing is valid and it is helping people. So even just having the conversation, not so much about, we don't, you know, the promoting side, I just, I just go to right away. Yeah. Your business minded. It, it makes, yeah. But it makes me feel a lot more confident to go, oh, there's a category that I, fit into there's also a category I could go to for my own help too yeah okay. I'm finding lead, that community for sure yeah uh, it's valuable I need an art therapist <laughs> it, I mean it's it's super valuable for sure so let's talk a little bit about why it's valuable now mm -hmm. yeah we'll move on um and to be um quite honest um it's, can you guys see the screen? Yes. Okay. Let me try that again. I think it's this one. Okay, there we are. Okay. So I'm just gonna, I think I might go here instead. Okay. So I'm just going to maybe skip a few parts because I think we've already touched on some of this stuff. So uh, that's how in your audience is with what's going on. Yeah, you guys are right in there. So um, I was just going to talk about a little bit, uh, a little bit about the uh, quarantine and the stay home measures. At first, so just to put it in perspective, at first, um, 
this was, you know, the government, the World Health Organization, this was to keep people safe physically. And, but what really ended up happening very quickly was we saw that these restrictions that were put in place to keep people safe and comfortable um, exposed bad communication from our politicians, it exposed psychological problems in our society, physical problems inside in our society as like double core, core morbidity sort of popped up as a, a risk factor for COVID and also all the consequences of isolation. And in my readings, um, previous studies that popped up were primarily done uh, for isolation on older people. So there were a lot of studies on does getting an older person a pet um, give them a more positive outlook? Will they live longer? Like lots of studies on that. And the other category that was studied a lot as when it came to isolation and the adverse effects was ostracized and isolated people who had experienced previous plagues or pandemics such as SARS and Ebola and AIDS. There was a lot of um, research done on isolation in those groups and, and what loneliness and isolation ends up doing to a person. But now we're looking at an entire population, a global population, right? So these, the new studies that are coming out, that's why I said I was excited about what I'm going to be reading over the next little while, because this is a whole nother ball game, right? This is, we're dealing with all different types of people. We're not looking at just one factor about them. So my question is how soon after the world health organization's announcement, were you delivering online culture-based activities or interventions? So I'll go first. I was at first, I, I think April, so it was, I think it was March 11th that they announced the pandemic, a worldwide pandemic. And I think by April, I was already developing pivots for online activities. What about you, Tracy? I'm different. I needed to go MIA. I... I didn't start up until I hired my life coach and she said, get your ass back in the game. And I was terrified. And it was about June, April, May, June, January, February, March, April, May, June. Like June, July, like June, I started planning. And it really wasn't um, until way later on that I said, okay, I'm just gonna put this out there to stay relevant because I was feeling really not relevant. And, uh, and then, so I got the first group, I think after, like in September, like I'm like, I went MIA, I was missing people were, uh, my students were kind of contacting me saying like, asking me, how are you? What are you doing? Let's talk. So I started talking to people on the phone and people started sending me um, pictures of the artwork they were doing at home and asking me to help them finish it. Like, what do you think about the light source? Um, I'm trying to do water. Do you have any pointers, any tips? And my community of students, I guess, helped me get back in. They were, they were my support system. I don't think they actually knew it. I almost just got emotional over that. <laughs> I remember talking to you during that time and I sent you an article or a blog I wrote on imposter syndrome. Yeah. Do you remember yes. that? So I was like, this is ridiculous. No, 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 no. And I sent you like 10 tips to beat imposter syndrome or something. I, I just thought, wow, like I just did not think that there was an essential need for, for what I was doing anymore. I was also trying to be a consultant for creatives in, uh, for their, you know, entrepreneur, their, their creative path, their entrepreneurial pathway. I'm going, well, what the heck can people do now? I can't get them to start a business now. <laughs> like, everything kind of crashed on me, but I think it was September that I started actually getting people in to paint with me. I think I, I might be a little bit off on the months there, but it took a while. Yeah. That's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good answer. Brian. The, uh, 
I actually, I, I don't know if the, my, our screen is being recorded here uh, with us on it as I'm doing this, because I've been looking down at my phone. I actually had to go back and um, I, I saw that our first production went, didn't go live until June. And that was at the emphasis, impetus of our, uh, uh, the production company, it's Mortar and Pestle Productions. And uh, they said, look, this is gonna go on for a while, guys, who ended doing uh, something live? So, uh, you know, we were just, uh, I lost my job back in 2020 because of the pandemic and they said, oh, don't worry, it's just gonna be a couple months, we'll have you back. And yeah, we're, we're still not back. But, um, so we, I've been doing other things, uh, but yeah, so the first uh, first time we went live with it was June and we're right now we're putting out a uh, show every two weeks. And I'm not always on the cast, uh, but you know, it's something that I can listen to even when I'm not involved in it. So, so it took a while to, to ramp things up and um, yeah, I'll send you, I'll send you something too also um, when we're offline here. There is something uh, uh, totally about the imposter syndrome, uh, somebody I've followed, uh, her name is Mel Robbins. And I don't know if you've heard of her, but yeah, you know her, Tracy. Yeah, she, uh, I, I got this whole talk from her about uh, when you're stuck in imposter syndrome and stuff. Like Five that. second rule. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I want to say, Brian, that June 2020, that was only three months, um, three, three months and a little bit for you guys to put all of that together. And that's still very impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hats, hats off to my uh, director and, and producer. <laughs> it did feel like a very long time. Yeah. Horribly. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. It still does. <laughs> Yeah. It's a blur. It's a blur. Yeah. Well, it's ongoing, right? So uh, it's going to, we don't know exactly what new normal is going to look like or when it's going to, you know, everybody's going to get vaccinated. I do know my aunt in Colorado, I spoke, or I was messaging with her. She said 90% of her state is vaccinated now. Wow. That's good news. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, so just going forward uh, a little bit, we went a little bit back and talked about past pandemics and how it affected mental health. But just talking um, now, like we all know that when we do an art therapy or an art activity, there's um, therapeutic components that come with it. And any artist will tell you that their clients, they say, oh, this was so good for me. And I was so relaxed or I had so much fun. And you innately know what's happening. Like you innately know something positive is happening. Um, so I think what this has done is exposed um, a growth potential for the profession of art therapy. And it's young compared to the regular established cognitive therapy and behavioral therapies. However, like art therapy is being used in those as well um, because people see the benefits of it. But my point here is whether you knowingly applied innovative strategies for wellness or simply cultivated from the residual effects of participation, you contributed to reduce stress, decrease trauma, reactions and decreased depression so you can feel good about that you are essential <laughs> yeah so I wanted to investigate more about that because oh, I wanted to investigate more about that because I wanted to know what the role of the artist really was so I kind of dived into a little bit more and I was just really surprised that there were so many studies already done by like two months ago. I think I, st I stopped reading about this maybe a month ago. Um, so do you think that art and culture is essential in its own right as a form of therapy and especially during COVID? Brian? I would, I would have to say a hundred percent. And uh, again, it's sort of a new context to look at it, a new light to look at it in. I just think um, 
all the different modalities that I'm familiar with, uh, with the mindfulness meditations, br uh, the new breathing, everybody's off on these breathing, uh, um, uh, again, a modality for just controlling your breath. It's sort of the Wim Hof stuff. There's uh, the EFT stuff, all these different things, but there's a lot, a lot of people can't really relate to it. And I think in a lot of ways uh, uh, that just everybody can sort of relate whether you're a good artist or not, you know how to hold a pencil. And if you can get lost in that or, or what's the puzzle or uh, uh, that Zen doodling, that kind of thing uh, as, as an art form slash therapy, absolutely. Anything that you can uh, sort of focus your mind down and strip away all the art that has built up and be able to focus on something and, and, conversations I've had with people whilst they're engaged uh, in, in other activities to, and it just sort of frees up the mind and lets, lets all the, that stuff go. So yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Tracy, do you concur? I do because I mean, even, you know, when I was working with the students, I'd have to say, let's, you know, I have to watch to see their mannerisms and their physical, because now I'm online with them. And I'm learning some body language that comes out where I'm able as a, as like a art, like a coach or a teacher to say, okay, everyone, let's take a deep breath. And I've incorporated um, the breathing into my teaching. So I have chicha trees. So I say, everyone take a deep breath and chit-chit-chit-chit-chit-chit-chit-chit-chit. And when you're done and you don't have any more breath, your tree's done. And I've started to do these things because it keeps people more positive when painting with them. I wasn't thinking about it as breathing. I was thinking of it like, how can I keep them engaged? So, you know, they're kind of all with me on screen going chit, 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 and they're chit, 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 chit. chit. <laughs> and I think that whether it's visual arts or music, or I think um, we don't, the pressure of doing the breathing exercise and meditation and all those kind of things that are coming out now can be, I don't know how to do that. Like when you're walking into the gym for the first time, but if you're able to go in and not think about what you're doing and just lose yourself in the moment, the breathing is coming, the meditation is coming. And I don't think people realize they're getting that while doing the, the the art or the music or the dancing, right? I don't think they think of it that way, but now they're starting to see, oh, this is also happening while I'm doing it. Right, so, you know, oh, go ahead. Yeah, that's sort of what uh, I was circuitously uh, alluding to uh, was you've got all these different mo modalities, EFT, that, the, oh, I've got to tap in this specific pattern to, uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the EFT, but you have to tap in a specific pattern and, and people can get lost in that or just, oh, am I bre if it's a breathing exercise, am I doing that right? You, you, you don't have to think about that when you're, when you're engaged in art or something as, as uh, static as, as listening to a radio program or something like that. You know, there's, it's a different level of engagement, easier. And uh uh, yeah, I think I think it definitely could be approached as uh, 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 again. I'm, I'm being sort of blown away by this whole discussion. It's yeah, as as a therapy, yeah. Yeah. So, so maybe social prescription isn't that far out of an idea. Yeah. And um, maybe the studies that come out of this moment in history are going to facilitate uh, further investigation of other avenues of art therapy over just the, you know, traditional uh, thought of um, client therapist approach. Mm -hmm. um, I think the world has just borne witness to sort of a birth of uh, a rebirth of an appreciation for the arts in a new light. And again, that's my humble opinion. <laughs> Wouldn't it be absolutely amazing you know how like workplaces, uh, they cover your masseuse or your chiropractor. Wouldn't it be just a fantastic thing if someone said, well, could, you know, could you cover, you know, Tracy Berry's art class or this dance yeah. class or this improv? So or there are a few that do that, actually. There's um, a, com 
yeah, there's a company that approached me. Um, they, they find large companies, small companies, whatnot. Um, the one that I'm connected, connecting with, she's got a line on um, banks from all over Ontario, a, a brand, branches from one bank, um, as well as wineries and whatnot. And they come to her for to buy her yoga, or this or that. And she wants me to develop a, a therapeutic art that companies can buy either a pre recorded wow. video or you can wow. do. And so she set up this business during COVID. Um, the thing is, it, she wants it all to be cohesive. So you need to buy in. So I would buy in for like, say $1,000, I would get access to professional studio and, and editing and marketing and everything. And my, you know, and I would get uh, residuals every time somebody purchased it. And so these companies, they're, they're putting aside um, wellness money. Wow. Yeah. And now we're kind of, like you're saying, it's coming around that now we're being included in that. Yeah. So now they're not just thinking massages and chiropractor, they're thinking art and arts involvement. The, the number of, uh, oh, I'm, am I muted? No, I'm not. No. Uh, the, the number of uh, op options that have come available online now, uh, having people to talk to, um, having uh, different apps that relay the information back to whether it's alive with somebody or not. I, I have uh, meetings with my doctor now and it, it's, I don't need to go in person unless there's something that requires in person. So the, the whole virtual uh, learning uh, therapy, everything has just exploded through this. Uh, I mean, I remember the first time I had a family Zoom meeting. Remember, everybody was taking screenshots. Look, I just talked to my whole family and all the, everybody in business going, yeah, we've been doing that for a year. But it just, the uh, Zoom just seemed to be there right when we needed it. And uh, as, a, as a method for getting this stuff out and uh, uh, whether it's the recorded material you're talking about in, in the studio there for a thousand dollars. I mean, yeah. that's, that's a way of getting therapy out to people that wouldn't conventionally be thought of. Right. And the reason for that is this, <laughs> I've taken these numbers off of the world health organization yesterday, and you can see this is, you know, staggering numbers. So the world has changed in many ways and we're going to see, this is just one of those changes. Um, the good news is that the vaccine doses are coming, uh, are increasing and uh, everybody's getting vaccinated. So, but it really was a crisis that created this increased psychological risk and um, the outcome that we might not even see for months after this pandemic, mm -hmm. but it really changes how we look at things like even work and school and um, how we pivot and and things like that now to online. Um, yeah, and then just like briefly among the, you know, the first reactions were obviously fear and anxiety. And I wanna point out a few things about artists as well um, in this realm. So I mentioned like communication was really off. Like our politicians were saying one thing, health officials were saying one thing. Artists were able to temper that and bring it all together into sort of like um, infographics and uh, get that message across clearly, um, you know, gather the facts and it takes a graphic designer to create a nice poster like that, right? Um, also messages of hope, you know, artists are out there all over the world creating these street murals and large outdoor art, um, you know, and then we saw this sort of thing, right? Uh, everybody's painting windows and signs and banging their pots and pans together for the health workers. And, you know, we appreciate you health workers. And, and that was all creativity. So something happens when you strip humans down to just the bare essentials. They want this piece that makes us human, right? Which is this stuff. So and then shortly after this, we saw all these zoom, right? Like you were talking about all these images of zoom meetings. So this is just what makes us human, really. Um, the eagerness to participate in these social activities. So it's undeniable to me, um, how important this all this stuff was in mitigating the adverse effects of loneliness. Um, people singing on balconies in Italy, and 
you know, stuck in a building, like um, waving at their neighbors through windows. And, you know, still today, the, the kids, you know, this is a, a local, um, what is this, uh, 20, yeah, last month, this picture on the bottom here um, of children making signs for local health workers. I mean, it still continues, right? It's a big part of what's going on. It might be kind of flying under the radar a little bit, but when we look back on it, I think it's it's really going to be present. I'm, I'm at this point, I'm almost going to stop for the uh, hot bang. <laughs> I have dented in the kitchen. We got really enthusiastic in our neighbor. So, but it's, yeah, it just, uh, it's a warm feeling, the sense of community that came together through all this. Yeah. And of course, social services were doing their thing with like food banks and things like that too. Like all of that really great stuff was happening, but I think it, that's all essential, right? That's considered essential. Uh, and I think the point I'm making is this stuff is just as essential for well-being. Um, yeah. And then just the eagerness of everybody to sign up. I was so timid because I paint people's windows, right? That's a part of what I do as well. You can pay me. I go and I paint your window for whatever you like for whatever season. And all I could do for a long time was paint my own windows. And I people thank me. They say, you know, I always walk by and make sure that my kids go by and see your windows um, because I know it changes every season. And, and I, uh, you know, that was surprising to me. Like, I, I mean, I think people like my windows, but for people to say thank you for painting your windows was something I wasn't expecting, I guess. And so now I'm looking at, should I, as now more people have the vaccine and wear a mask and it's summertime, so I could probably paint windows outside because I was always doing the inside but now I could probably say do you want your windows painted like you know well I don't know you had mentioned it so I was like yeah I mean we did it too we we would walk around our neighborhood and there was one guy locally that had a certain pattern that he told everybody to paint it was like a heart stained glass heart window or whatever I think I did a little care bear and he was holding a balloon and it said, I care in the balloon or something. I can't remember, but oh, we, yeah, me and Mateo did it as well. My son, um, but we would walk around the neighborhood and all the, it was a campaign around here. Mm -hmm. And painted rocks was a big one. People hiding painting rocks with uh, inspirational quotes on it around here and in Thunder Bay. So yeah, the they rock, were here you know, too. Hide, yeah. it, hide it or you keep it. They're and still on the, the beach. We can find them when you go for how... rocks how good they got like there's some amazingly like there was one person who did a full poem and hit all these five rocks like i guess it was called a pose hit all these five rocks and you wanted to find all five rocks because you needed to finish the poem it was just it was wonderful it's been wonderful so that was well thought out yeah yeah okay so i mean um we're talking about, you know, why are we doing all this, this extra stuff? Why are we planning all this stuff? Well, it's because of the increased, you know, loneliness and the fear that ended up turning into isolation, depression, and physical symptoms such as fatigue and reduced autoimmune, which put us at risk, greater risk, right? Of if you got the virus of becoming really sick. Um, and so what is that? Um, that's burnout. So I have a little um, definition of burnout here, which I think is going to be interesting for you guys to hear. And um, I'm going to read it. So burnout eventually occurs when a person does not have the capabilities to cope with a stressful situation and becomes constantly stimulated. This constant state of arousal eventually leads to psychological and physiological exhaustion. It includes the outcomes include impaired thought processing, risk of developing depression, anxiety, memory loss, learning issues, deci um, faulty decision-making, um, uh, aggravating obsessive compulsive disorders. Um, it impacts sleep, uh, eating habits, and the ability to maintain good mental and physical health. So like how, how gravity, like the gravity of what was actually happening and knowing now and, and rethinking, adjusting your thinking of what art was 
interventions were doing during that time? Do you realize, you know, how impactful what you were doing actually was painting your windows? I am, I'm, I have this big expression on my face and I'm laughing, but I'm laughing because it's a whoa moment and I'm, I can relate, but then I'm like, I, I can, I can, it sometimes it just takes someone listing a list like that off for you to go, holy, holy, you know, so I, (laughs) I can see it. I can see you're going, ah, (laughs) (laughs) and as well, like there are people who are at greater risk. So one of the studies said that it has nothing to do with the amount of time, this loneliness and isolation and social restrictions went on. You could be perfectly fine if you've, you know, got a, a pool in your backyard and a fine stock of wine and a loving, you know, family who's not getting on your nerves that you're not going to be as affected as perhaps somebody who has a negative view of life. Uh, loneliness, even in the presence of others, because they're unhappy with their interpersonal relationships, Um, healthcare workers, or if you've lost somebody to COVID, you're at greater risk of developing all those burnout factors. And also if you had previous mental health conditions, right. Or if you live alone, uh, that's why it's important to know who's um, to have an idea of who's attending these things introverts were starting to be uh they're starting to see more that introverts are being affected and and they thought well you know with introverts potentially not but they have no one to be introverted towards right now yeah they don't know where to place their emotions but that's like artists too right because it's like Mm -hmm. oh well does this really affect artists i mean it does but do i love sitting in my studio alone yeah yeah Mm -hmm. (laughs) so it's Mm -hmm. it's a balance what do you think brian I, th- I think there's uh, the, uh, a balance that has to be between that. Uh, you were listing off that, that whole list of things and, and going like, if it was a checklist of things I've been going through personally, and I've, I've got a good support network and everything, but at, at different levels, all that stuff was happening. And mm-hmm. there was only these little respites of escape that were uh, doing the, the art program I was doing and, and doing the radio shows and, and just taking time to be creative and, and engage in that. So, yeah, right. uh, I, it, it was very easy to feel, even though there wasn't any specific oh. stuff and the I... burnout was well defined there. Right. And burnout isn't, isn't exclusive to any like as you can see there are several risk factors but it's not exclusive and like I said this is a worldwide situation we're in and we had to all adapt very our brains had to adapt very quickly to um, unexpected situations and prolonged loneliness and maybe not loneliness but social isolation which you know is we're, we're social creatures so I think when everybody is stepping forward now and saying, yeah, I was affected as well. Um, it just shows so much about like the extent of all of this and, and we're not even seeing the extent of it really yet. Um, I mean, there's stats that came out about like, uh, violence against women stats, um, and suicide stats have come out, but I don't think we're going to really see, um, until the end. So it's just important to, to, as you're teaching these things, you know, you might have somebody who shows up that day, happy as a clam, but really they're dealing with a lot, right? And um, you're providing them with, you know, Tracy, you're providing a class that's going to make them smile short term. Um, but the question is, and one of these are one of, this is one of the questions I really want answered is how, how does that, like, how do you make that long term? So how do you keep that relationship? How do you transition after the the world is safe again into in person? And how do you support people with that? Like you were saying, like, I know I, I do certain things, but maybe it is getting that partner that you that you refer them to after your session. Like if anybody needs a further, you know, support, and maybe it's not in your job description, but maybe it's something you want to add as a feature of what you do. Um, okay. So before I move on, does anybody have any more comments about this? Because I just wanted to quickly talk about developing programs um, and let you know a little bit about what I've been up to. Does anybody have anything to add to this whole burnout um, conversation? <laughs> no. I love the idea if we could take this 
burn out conversation and one day expand upon it. I'd like to know more on it. And I think through conversation, that's where I stir up a lot of ideas. And like, I, I would like to hear more about it later on. Like yeah. Maybe, Burnout maybe. and chronic stress, more. right? Mm-hmm. Like PTSD and things like that. Exploring yeah. those. Yeah. I agree. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we're going to lighten it up. <laughs> I'm going to take, I'm taking you on a roller coaster here. Uh, I want to talk about, um, <laughs> <Such is> life. <laughs> yeah. I just want to talk like just a little bit about how I do planning to give you some, um, ideas of how to organize planning. Cause a lot of times you jump in, you're like, I really want to paint this tree and I want people to attend and, or I really want to do this play and, um, we're going to market it here and hopefully people listen, but there's so much more that's, uh, potentially you you can include. So the way I started is almost like a program logic model. That's sort of the term that they use for this approach project, uh, program logic model. It's a planning tool. So um, first I always look at, I get an idea, but then I say, okay, what what do I have? What resources do I have? Can I get a grant for that? Can I get a sponsor for that? Do I have money for that? Do I want to do it for free? How much time do I have? Do I have partners to pull this off? So I look at what I have access to first before ever starting something. Um, Maybe that's a safety coping skill for me, but that's how I operate. (laughs) So I always want to make sure I'm not like chewing off too much. Tracy, you know this, cause I'm always like, I don't have any time. Nope. Maybe later. I don't, you know, maybe let's, let's come back to that another time because mm-hmm. I have to be very careful, especially with school. Um, but then as well, so I look at next, I look at outputs. So what activities do I want to run? Um, how do I want people to participate? What do my participants look like? Um, and then I, I'm growing in this section, the person environment fit. Looking back, there were a few people that I accepted that I, that I knew were going to be disruptors in the groups. Um, but because I was just starting out, I took everybody and anybody. And it did disrupt, you know, a couple people, including myself. And if I had screened people better and put better boundaries and planned better boundaries, I could have avoided some conflict looking back. So I'm, that's an area I'm working on. And then outputs and impacts. So what are the short term? Uh, so what are the outcomes for you? And what are the outcomes you hope for the people who are listening to your play or listening or watching you uh, paint? So, or whatever it is that you do. So this is sort of like my version of that short term for me, I'd like to see like 40 people engage in my activity short term for them. I'd like to see them have some short term mindfulness moments where they can escape their, their problems just for a little while, medium term, um, they come back and they do it again, or maybe they do another one of my projects or programs And at this stage for them, my goal for them is to begin thinking, ah, maybe I need art in my life. Long-term for my business plan, my, myself and my goals is that they will be part of my social community, that they will be paying customers. Maybe they'll buy a painting and um, they'll be very engaged with me. Long-term for them, I want them to bring art in almost like it's part of their lifestyle. It's part of their self-care routine. That's the long-term goal, mm-hmm. right? And that, that runs through most of my programming. So um, we were talking, you were talking about your friend who does doors. Um, this was my first pivot. I had received a grant prior to the COVID restrictions. We were going to get 10 artists. We were each, we were going to jury them out. They were each going to paint a door. We were going to hang 10 doors on this fence in front of this ugly barn in this community garden that we wanted, you know, to hide. And we were going to unveil it during a wearable art fashion show. Well, (laughs) that didn't happen. (laughs) So instead of giving the money back, um, I was encouraged to think and pivot. So what we ended up doing was we lost the sponsors that we thought we were going to have. Um, We got a recycled paint company to donate paint, an upcycling company to donate salvage doors. 
Um, we could only pay four artists and we had volunteers in the garden um, painting the other four. My son actually painted one and uh, I painted one as well. And eight doors were fashioned together. So we hope to revisit this and finish off the other two, but it looks beautiful. It's in the garden now. Um, in October, they gave away pumpkins and you could come in one gate, um, grab your pumpkin, take a picture in front of it and walk out the other gate. So that was our pivot um, early on. And it was a fun one. So when I say I started in April, this is what I was working on. I absolutely love that you're giving people an opportunity to express themselves because look at all the different styles of doors and people are going online. Like how I'm going, I'm going to be starting to do backdrops for people because they're online all the time. And instead of a virtual background, you're giving them this you pick your door to express yourself with your pumpkin. And even that I think is doing so much for people. Yeah, more people than they following along know. on social media, yeah. we would say, okay, tell us what the next color for this door is. And we give them yeah. this picture up here with all the colors and somebody would say, I like the blue. And then, you know, two other people would say the green. So we'd be like, okay, green wins. And yeah, we do these little live videos and stuff. Like I, I wanted to do, I asked my husband, I'm like, can I paint wings on the side of our house? Like fairy wings. So people can come by and like take a picture with the fairy wings. He said, no, <laughs> but I wanted to, and I'm glad he was home that day. Cause I'm just somebody who does it once there's an idea and yeah. he was home. So he said, no, oh, so I gotta well. find a big piece of wood or some doors. Well, you got to <laughs> include it into one of your murals. That's what you got to do. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then here's like, just a quick look yeah, at man. what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, sorry, Brian, were you saying something? Oh, mm -hmm. No, it's okay. I was just going to say you could put some, leave some your husband comes home <laughs> oh it froze actually i didn't hear what you just said there oh okay no i was <laughs> saying that uh you could paint wings on doors lean them up against the house and take the doors down when your husband yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> yeah get some upcycle doors it, he'd be like well let's do it now i don't know <laughs> oh i guess i shouldn't poke he, the bear if we're isolated yeah too <laughs> maybe not yeah maybe not in the future paint paint it on a big wall somewhere in town yeah that'd be phenomenal i could probably ask the township for that. that's a great idea i'm gonna write that down actually contact township <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh brian you're probably not familiar with all of these little things that i'm doing uh tracy's pretty familiar with it um this first one here is a Pathfinder series is actually what we're doing right now, which is uh, in-depth discussions about all things arts related um, and peer mentoring and whatnot, peer support. Um, recently, what I did was I added a 30 minute drop in session just to connect and socialize. And, and so I just picked these little topics, like what inspires you or things like that. And anybody can come, just drop in, have a quick conversation, connect uh, in between the Pathfinder series, like while you're waiting for the next one to come along. Gentle painting. Where is that, uh, oh, sorry. Um, where, where is the creative conversations is that on Facebook group or? Um, you can find all this information on my website, which is www.bwimsy.wimsyartloft.ca. Shannon, why don't yeah. you write it into the, the chat? Yeah, I can. Yeah, for sure. I'll do that. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll give you some more information about where to find all this stuff. Mm -hmm. sure. That's also for people who are going to be tuning in and watching this in, uh, in replay, right? So yeah, and I think I'm Yeah, for sure. Um, and then so like gentle painting as well, that was a pivot. So I had joined um, a fundraising committee for a trauma response ther therapy organization or business. And um, I guess like the wait lists were just getting like crazy long and they wanted to do well together at the committee. We uh, said, okay, let's do an online channel sort of. So we had like Zumba and yoga and things like that. And this was my contribution, gentle painting, which is a take on the traditional painting tutorial, but um, it's a lot of like finger painting. I included lots of soft music. I encouraged like deviation from the original painting. 
Um, and then again, so their, their list got very long and it was explained to me that, um, we were, what we were in fact were doing, we're promoting something that they didn't have the capacity to fill. So I pivoted again and um, I had a grant for that. So I had to write out the grant. So what I did was I made art kits and YouTube tutorial videos of gentle painting. Hmm. So I distributed the kits and inside the kit was the uh, YouTube link. Um, Pen Pals project is um, something that came up in my, uh, as an assignment for school in applied psychology. Um, what I did was uh, I take two creatives and I randomly match them together. So maybe 12 or 14 people sign up each round. You get randomly matched, you create back and forth in a call and response for two weeks. And then I do an online exhibit and we do an artist chat to discuss our journey and our inspirations for what we made. And the next one is in June. So anybody can sign up, musicians, poets, we have creative writers, photographers. And then the Living Library is the newest addition to my development. <laughs> um, I did this in 2018 at Brock at the Women's Leadership Summit. We did the Living Library of Resilient Women. And we um, had a photographer, this is Barry on the end here, he's sort of my partner on this podcast. Um, he took pictures of all the women and I turn, uh, I had a student intern turn them into book covers. We also had a volunteer writer um, interview them and write a little synopsis, sub, I can't say it, sub, synopsis. And the first question we always ask is, if your life were a novel, what would the title be? So we put these book covers and they became privacy screens of this event. And so you could walk into the room and read the book cover and choose who you wanted to speak with. It was so popular. Wow. And so now we're turning that into a podcast. So, that sounds amazing. Yeah. So you guys are going to be on it now. I'm recording you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking I about can't. that earlier. I'm like, this is going to be a great podcast and I don't use video to sound. Yeah. Um, so I think this would make a great podcast actually about resilience. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I can't even begin to think what I would use for the title of my book. So. <laughs> well, you better think of one. <laughs> okay. If your life were a novel, what would the title be? Yeah. It's incredible. I love that where these are all going. Cause I'm like, I should just, I wish I can have a recording of my brain with all these ideas because I can't write them down fast enough, not to take ideas, but just things to that expand on it. And yeah, not even expand, like just things I could, I could think to, to mentally help myself move forward. Like if my life was a book, a novel, what would it, it you know what I mean? Like I, I, I enjoy conversations like this because it's, it makes it we're really getting uh, you know we're thinking was making us think wow maybe don't put that part in i, <laughs> <laughs> I can edit stuff out for sure <laughs> the first thing that came to find uh for for my uh my book cover title would uh, uh just steal it from the license plate yours to discover so or mine to discover. Love it. yours to discover or mine to discover okay yeah. <laughs> mine <laughs> mine like it just put a little spin on it you know yeah my life i would say oh i didn't mean to interrupt you sorry oh, i would i would probably say like my the title would probably be um something like uh and then onward to the next day or something like that like a, uh, you know acknowledging that it's a journey and not there's no destination like but well you can think it through for a bit and then get back yeah to <laughs> yeah for sure um but because you're not local I can't send Barry to take your picture sorry yeah <laughs> so you'll have to send some me something photographers yeah I'll send get me someone something. to take a picture yeah I work with some photographers so you too Brian send me your picture <laughs> yeah. um and then maybe I'll follow up with a few questions for the synopsis but mm -hmm. uh either way um yeah so the podcast is going forward and, and that's pretty interesting for me yeah that's awesome I, I love the whole living library concept it's it's brilliant thank you yeah it was uh something that was in the back of my mind for a long time and I got a lot of no's when I tried to do it in not-for-profit um and then I just kind of yeah it was a project that everything sort of fell into place and when I left my last um the place of uh work where I did this uh, I asked the executive director if I could take it with me and she said yes 
Nice. Yeah. That's, that's nice. Okay. And then this is the last question. Do you use a program activity uh, development outline or strategy when you're creating your offerings? I mean, yeah. Um, it's not as I'm better helping others, like, I guess, again, streamline and create, um, a, like a program or some kind of strategy in moving forward. But for myself, I find that I have, um, you know, like the top three things I want to get done each day. And, um, I tend to, I, this is going to sound funny, but I made a bingo sheet and all of my large goals for, you know, the next one to two to three months, um, I created my own bingo sheet and I, you know, if I fill up the bingo sheet, I get a prize for myself. It's no, it's my strategy, but it's not. I love really, it. Yeah. And it's funny that I'm here and I'm, I'm looking at like uh, Rhiannon's platform and I'm going, wow, that, that, that she, she, she's, you know, that's a business like strategy. And I'm like, I have a bingo sheet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But to each their own. Right. So like, I yeah. kind of do that too. I have um, like a to-do list. It's like a bingo mm-hmm. sheet. I could, so, okay. I have to organize this for this one and organize that for that one and call this person. And then I get to cross them off. Yeah. And it's fun to do. And, you know, it's, it, it doesn't make it as a number one, number two, number three, number four thing. It's sporadic. So if I wake up and I go over there and I, you know, you get those angry butterflies where you're like, I'm supposed to be productive, but I don't want to be, um, I can go to the bingo sheet and go, Hey, if I can get that done, that's a full line. And then, you know, Keith is making me dessert that night, that kind of thing, you know, like it's, I like how it's Keith making the dessert. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, well, he's my support system, that's for sure. But uh, well, if I, yeah. if I uh, make a uh, bingo sheet and cross off a line, will Keith make me a dessert? <laughs> we'll send it to you. It might have to be cookies. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that idea. Maybe maybe offline you can uh, send it to uh, send me yeah. the, what it would look like. I, I can sort of visualize in my mind what it would look like. But yeah. uh, I, I think that's... Uh, that's the way I engage things is a little more sporadically too. So, you know, if I have to go linear through stuff, I just, uh, creative nature, I'm all over the map. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it started off with, um, I got a a new puppy, my very first dog ever. And, um, it was the Onyx's puppy adventure bingo sheet because she has to be exposed to so many things and it's hard during a pandemic to know what to do or how to do it. So I started writing down things that I could do um, to expose her to loud sounds, parking lots, things like that. And it worked, it's been working. She's a wonderful dog. I'm doing a great job with her. So I thought I should probably make one for myself. (laughs) And so that's how it started. I think it's a brilliant idea, so yeah. Oh, awesome, awesome. (laughs) So what do you do? (laughs) Uh, I make to-do lists and then ignore them. Oh, uh, okay. you know Quarantine. what? You should record your voice in different characters telling you to do specific things. <laughs> like an authoritative one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I immediately went to Kermit. You know, that's not authoritative. Hey, get off your ass. You know, <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> Can you sing It's Not Easy Being Green for us? Oh. Uh, I, I can do a rainbow connection. Okay, do oh, that one. I love that one. Why are there so many songs about rainbows? That's it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I, thought you're, I thought you were gonna play us out. I to, awesome. Yeah, I have to. I have to get the puppet to get it working. Okay. I can't next remember. Time. I got uh, you know, <laughs> like back in my fifties, I had more puppets than I was when uh, when I was five. So I figured. Uh, but I also, oh, the Muppets are tremendous, uh, tremendous influence. It makes, yeah. See, all this talk of creativity and stuff is, I, I used to work with kids and I had, like I said, more puppets than I knew what to do with. But, hey, you know, the old guys from the Muppet show, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah. so, again, this, is, this has been uh, an inspiring, illuminating conversation. And <laughs> I appreciate it. You know, it was a small group, but it was great. It was wonderful. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it was I, perfect. 
Yeah. Yeah. Cause uh, we all got to really get dive in there and, and figure a few th- ideas out and mm-hmm. sounds like you got a lot get out a whole, of it. It's more percolating. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. This is, this is a large pot and it's all uh, coming together there. So it's lovely. Yeah. yeah I'm absolutely. so glad that you joined us and um, my pleasure. Uh, Tracy, do you want to talk a little bit about what might be coming next month? Next month. Yeah, so I had an idea for next month for creative conversations and pathfinding artists. Um, well, I really wanted to find a way to inspire a thought that we during these times can adjust, pivot, and use kind of our um, favorite things from our imagination a little bit from our childhood. And um, so I came across a great uh, theory. I can't remember the, the book that was written on it. Um, and I'm going to find it for next month. But it's um, speaking about your five alternative lives. And that's why I think I was, it was really interesting that, you, uh, Rianne, you had mentioned the, uh, if you, what would be the title of your own book. So I think we should probably decide on what's your, what would be the title of your book before next month. So we can, that could be a great challenge because when you think of your five alternative lives, these are just aspects of five different aspects of yourself that you could have taken that path, but because you didn't, it might've gotten lost and being able to connect with where you think you would have gone those four other lives that kind of you put off to the side to move this way, it re reintroducing them back into your life. And I think that um, it's a great way to um, basically stimulate, yeah, creation in your life and manifest wonderful things and people and also just keep you stable and grounded um, and bring a little bit of excitement into your life during these times and prepare to go back out in public as a developed new you. And so that's what I would like to talk about next month. I think it's I think it's a great topic. So that's, yeah, especially yeah. as we're re-entering, right? We're and re-entering, then, and I yeah. think it'll help with that re-entering that those boundaries, you know. Yeah, and um, yeah, I've read a little bit on re-entry anxiety as well. So if you want some notes on that, yes, <laughs> yeah, and I think that's where I'm going to kind of go into it is being able to talk about that. And of course, we don't want to take up everything for today I'm writing down notes as we go in because I think it's important that each of these talks can um stem from each other and and kind of you know we can pick up where we left off and then move into another direction so that's what pivoting is right taking what we've learned from these talks and moving into the next thing yeah or changing it up as these things get thrown at us right we don't know what's gonna happen so we don't know when we're gonna open or if the summer we I wanted to do outdoor paint classes I don't know if that's gonna even happen (laughs) so um so yeah so that would be on the 27th so Brian if you're interested in that I can I believe Rhiannon has your email for this one because we switch up hosts for each time Okay. Um, we can place you um, in an email, just rem- uh, like a reminder for next month, if you're interested no, that's, and no that's pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and anyone else, if you're seeing this, because I believe it's going to be going up. I think it'll um, be um, voice only. Oh, voice only. For the podcast. Yeah. I think yeah. So. I'm a visual artist. So seeing is a part of my vocabulary. I don't say, well, you understand or I hear you. I say, oh, I see that. I see. Yeah. That. yeah. And your the book cover, your book covers will be the image. Yeah, yeah. I love that. And then the only other thing I'm doing right now currently is I have my poetry challenges going up on uh, my uh, group, which is Canadian Hatched Poetry. Um, it, you can see it's a branch from the Nest Studio and then Canadian Hatch Poetry is the group. And the I Need a Challenge, it's going to be going up towards the end of today. So I'm going to be putting the new challenge up today. The last one, because I basically I post it. That's my, it my like. post. It's, it's, it's the, uh, the bird. The, the gray parrot it yeah. knows over 160 words it can learn so I thought it'd be appropriate for a poetry group to use that as 
uh, the bird acknowledgement. And uh, yeah, so seven days, seven lines, write a poem where each line sentence is about each day of the week. Um, so that was the last one. And then, so a challenge number six is going up tonight. So you're more than okay. welcome to go to that. Page. I'm going to try to write another poem. Okay. <laughs> I think I, I missed the last challenge, but I got one, did one on yeah. the time machine one. Yes. That was awesome. Yeah. It's interesting. Okay. okay. That's all I have. Okay. Well, let's end this thing. <laughs> um, oh. Thank you so much for joining us, Brian. I hope you come back and uh, have another discussion with us either next month or if any of the other topics that come forward um, interest you at all. Brian, do you have anything will... coming up? Uh, for... Like I say, uh, we, we are uh, recording uh, The Brute tonight, and that will probably be um, on uh youtube and spotify coming up uh it takes about a month to go to air we sh we re record a couple weeks in advance but uh there's uh the company is uh, mortar and pestle productions and there is a channel on uh on spotify for that also on youtube and uh i guess the uh the thing there, there's also intermixed in it. There's also uh, an adult content radio program uh, if you are interested in that kind of thing. Uh, but the mortar and pestle uh, radio shows are, are the ones that uh, that I'm personally involved in. Awesome. But I'll, I'll send you a, a, a link for that as well. And, uh... Okay, yeah. And I think I'll send you my links as well. So we'll be... <laughs> Sending links all over all cyberspace. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome, though. This is why I think I enjoy being a part of this, because now our community is able to expand. And I've learned so much from you, Brian, too. Like, I, I just, I, I, I think, I hope you come to more of these, because you've been wonderful. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> no, this, is, this has been very informative for me. I, I that, uh, you feel you've learned as much as I, I know I've learned already. And then Scott, my, my, my mind, um, you were asking at the very start, I think before you started recording, how present were yeah. we? And at a time during the conversation, I you'd say something, I'd start going off and say, no, 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 listen, because I, I was getting ideas from what you were saying and I had to reel myself back in. So it's, it's been great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And thank you so much for your contributions too. And I look forward to listening to your radio show. I'm really excited. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, farewell. And see you next time. Have a great day. Have a great day. Take care.